Yeah, I've got ages because I just don't listen to you guys. Okay, and am I looking for you? Hello? Hello? <laughs> okay, so, um, hi everybody. Um, I'm Jonathan Louie, you all know who I am. And uh, I'm, besides the assistant, an assistant professor here, I'm the head of the exhibition committee uh, that led the production of, of this exhibit. Um, I'd like to just do a few thank yous and um, also, be, well, before I do that, I think I'm going to make several announcements. The first is that the, the auction to benefit the AIAS and ASO is ongoing for all of the drawings and objects that are in the exhibit. Um, it closes at 12 p.m. tonight, and it, it's on Facebook. So um, if you have any questions on how to access that, just, just talk to somebody from those organizations. And, and the second thing is that we're uh, joined by some incredible people with food and drinks. So feel free to get up and, and grab food, grab drinks, and, and just enjoy yourselves while we're <coughs> presenting. Rambling. Rambling. Uh, on behalf of the exhibition committee, um, Molly Hunker, Benjamin Farnsworth, and David Shanks, I'd like to thank the administration and staff for the support. And also John Bryant and our construction crew, Shaguni and Ujel. Um, for the production, and the 19 participants who took part in a six-month-long project that resulted in a consecutive series of drawings and objects. This kicks off the last event of the, pe of the uh, exhibition and the closing of the event, um, as well as the AIAS ASO auction. Um, joining me today for the panel discussion are six of my colleagues, Kyle, Kyle Miller, Ann Munley, Ted Brown, Molly Hunker, and the moderators, uh, Benjamin Farnsworth and David Chanks. Um, based on the surrealist parlor game, Exquisite Corpse, and the childhood game of telephone, 5x5 five five Chimera asked five unknowing groups of faculty members to translate the input before them. What I mean by that is, unknowingly, there were no starting group strategies. Each person reacted to the drawings they were given. And over the past six months, six uh, professors were asked to play with an, or an organized situation. They were given a loose set of rules and objectives, but were free to interpret the organization in relationship to their interests. Uh, starting with the poem, <coughs> The Wreck of a Circus Train, by Syracuse, Syracuse poet <laughs> Professor Hayden Carew, the project took on five consecutive waves. The first four waves asked for either plans, sections, elevations, axonometric, or perspective drawings, each one informed by the drawings done before. In the last wave, which began a month ago, the drawings became a rough guide, or a set of shop drawings, for the last wave, which was the objects. The player's experience essentially unfolds within a structured situation, and they are only aware of what is prior, but not after. The series is a result of playful translations that are not read individually, but in relationship from one to another. Just like the game of telephone, in this game, we learn that information can change in just a few whispers. So how do architects play? And the key word here is play. Playing is a medium where lived experience is organized as a structured situation, not just a period of relaxation from work, uh, in Johann Husenga's book, Homo Ludens, he describes play as a free and meaningful activity, carried out for its own sake, spatially and temporarily segregated from the requirements of practical life, and bound by a self-contained system of rules that hold absolutely. He defines five characteristics uh, that play must have. Play is free. It is, in fact, freedom. Play is not ordinary or real life. Play is distinct from ordinary life, both as to locality and duration. Play creates order, is order, and play demands order absolute and supreme. And play is connected with no material interest, and no profit can be gained from it. Furthermore, he goes on to say, it lies outside of the reasonableness, reasonableness of practical life. It has nothing to do with necessity, or utility, duty, or truth. To answer the question of play, perhaps it's important to think about the role of the project in architecture, as in project and practice. Or as Stan Allen puts it, in order to legitimate its repetitive procedures, 
Practice appeals to a project, an overarching theoretical construct, defined from someplace else and expressed in a language other than practice's everyday discourse. Situated at a distance from the operation sites of technique, theory stakes a claim on a world of concepts uncontaminated by real-world contingencies. The architectural project is a developed set of rule sets intrinsic to the individual. It offers creative fun and playful outtakes on architectural issues. The struggle and succession of architectural isms, isms versus itties and architectural practice. So um, I'm just going to talk to the kind of rules of, of this discussion. Um, we're joined by the four panelists and uh, we're going to hear from the four panelists first. They're going to be in a Pecha Kucha style presentation, which is uh, a, a structured method of pre presenting that uh, was formed because uh, Klein Dittum, the, the, the inventors, thought that architects talked too much. So the uh, organization is 20 slides, 20 seconds per slide. That's six minutes and 40 seconds for each of the uh, four presenters, Ted, then Kyle, then Molly, and then Anne. And then we're going to have, a, a, is it a, a breakdown or a, a, some, some sort of... Something will emerge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a reaction by, by Ben. And after that, um, we're going to have a question and answer session. And um, I, I'd love for everybody to um, feel free to join in. Um, yeah, let's go for it. Okay, it's the first time in, uh, in this format for me. So play. What's at play? How do we play? Why play? I'll try to construct this a little bit around refabrication or assemblage and deal somewhat with uh, simply the, we'll say, the genealogy of play. Start with uh, uh, Peter Eisenman. And many of us know Peter I Peter's works, the, the famous work dealing with formal structure in play, dealing with semiotics. Um, here's what I would call later play, uh, where Peter imports a game board, the I Ching, invents new rules or new possibilities, a kind of infinite play, a refabrication of the game, a game imported to architecture. That's just one form of, one form of play. Looking at the, the chimera, I got stuck with Ben's drawing, um, which I won't show. But think of that exercise as a way I was asked to do a section and, and really tried to use that as a way to interrogate section as, as both a process but maybe more importantly as a definition. That is to play with the image, what ways could you play with the image in order to arrive at an alternative, expanded or corrupted definition of play. That is to, to, to play to uncover new definitions of section a refabrication, if you will, of section. The outcome of section of play, the product, if you will, isn't so much a drawing, but rather is the text, this new definition. Um, and precisely because I know a little bit of Ben, we see one of several component parts that may be assembled or reassembled, but in taxidermy, the operation is skinning as opposed to sectioning. Um, that operation through sectioning is bloody and may lead to animalia aberrations, such as lion with an ostrich. Well, look, I want to do four things. Look at some of Brian Jungen's work, 
that deals with the use of mass-produced objects. Here we'll see plastic chairs and Nike Air Jordans. Redeployed in relation to native practices, totems, masks, rituals, and animals. Also look at Tara Donovan's work, but want to introduce uh, a couple of thoughts uh, from Walter Benjamin relative to play, and then one specifically from, from Leotard in relationship uh, to play. So you look at the images and I'll, I'll talk a bit. We think of the gene genealogy, at least in, in Germany, and I borrow this um, all from Miriam, Miriam Hansen, might think of, of uh, thought on play as really emerging with, with Schiller's aesthetic education of man. Uh, where he introduces the idea of the play drive as something that mediates sense drive and form drive. Um, that the sense drive demands that there shall be a stuff, you know, very, very dialectical. Uh, the sense drive demands that there shall be change and that time shall have a content. That form drive demands that time shall be annulled and that there shall be no change. That drive, therefore, in which both others work, work in concert, is the play drive as a kind of reconciliation. For Benjamin, he'll go from that to Carl Gross's Play of Man to Freud's essay beyond, essay beyond the Pleasure Principle. And for Benjamin, whom I'm sure many of you have know of, have read some of, um, he'll write on children at play, the animation of things, uh, on photography and play, and might touch on, oh, maybe three or four different, uh, uh, different thoughts there. One, emerging in one way street, and I'll quote from Benjamin in translation. Children are irresistibly drawn by the detritus generated by building, gardening, housework, tailoring, or carpentry. In waste products, they recognize the face that the world of things turns directly and solely to them. And using these things, they do not so much imitate the works of adults as bring together in the artifact produced in play materials of widely differing, differing kinds and new intuitive relationships. They'll introduce two aspects of, of art, semblance and play. I would argue that, uh, uh, that the Jurgens is deals with semblance and play, where Tara Donovan, which we'll see in a minute, uh, more exclusively play. I'll talk about Tara Donovan's work just briefly. Here, the use of mass-produced objects pins, pencils, plastics, putting them in play without foreknowledge of the outcome. In that sense, I would argue somewhat different than, than Jürgen. Here, a field dependent on local relationships, she stops because she runs out. She runs out of floor, she runs out of ceiling, or she runs out of wall. I'm going to turn to Leotard and leave uh, Benjamin far behind. Okay, if Benjamin's writing in 1921 and 1978, Leotard, in the postmodern condition, we'll talk about another kind of play dealing with rules, that the postmodern would be that which, in the modern, puts forward the unpresentable in the presentation itself, Kant's idea of the sublime. And then ultimately, the artist and the writer then are working without rules in order to formulate the rules of what will have been done. The work then has a character of an event. For Leotard, making explicit distinction between the modern and the postmodern, the modern being, say, that of Proust and Joyce, of taking rules that we know and putting them in play, here is just playing, for Leotard, playing to only arrive at the rules after you have completed play. So for Leotard, that is the postmodern. Our business not to supply reality, but to invent illusions to the conceivable, which cannot be presented. Despite the format, I'm still going to end up saying too much. I just only hope to stay on schedule. Uh, I'm not Mike. Ready? Steve. Number eight, Mike? Yeah. There we go. Okay, let's do it. Um, play it forward. When preparing for this presentation and revisiting the curatorial statement for the exhibition, a few key disciplinary issues seem critical to highlight. 
the role of found objects in speculative design, the relationship of one's work to that of their predecessors, and of course the notion of play in architecture as it relates to architectural production. To build on these issues, this presentation will primarily highlight the playful relationship established between architecture and di its diverse modes of becoming. Within this partnership, play and architecture, I'm primarily interested in the value of play as it pertains to more fixed architectural ingredients, such as medium and convention. To quote Michael Meredith, while convention may offer some protection against the anxiety generated by change, medium continually produces new enthusiasms and frictions, which exacerbate the improvisations of play. Uh, to ensure disciplinary relevance, we can put pressure on the improvisational nature of play by assigning it these two chaperones, convention and medium. As the 5x5 five five faculty exhibition does, this presentation is developed from an interest in heterogeneity, thresholds, seams, and ultimately the techniques of free collage. I'm reminded of 80s heartthrob MacGyver, the ultimate free collage, do it yourself par excellence. Uh, in the words of Claude uh, Levi-Strauss, the bricolor is someone who uses the means at hand, that is, the instruments he finds at his disposition around him, those which are already there, which had not been especially conceived with an eye to the operation for which they are to be used, and to which tr one tries, by trial and error, to adapt them, not hesitating to change them whenever it appears necessary. This definition might come in useful when making distinctions between architects we might understand as bricolors versus those as engineers. Whereas Mies achieves potency through abstraction, Le Corbusier, in, the, in using the formal simplicity born out of the necessities he saw in the large ocean liners of the day, constructs a new beauty for architecture. Le Corbusier is the bricolore, and Mies is the engineer. I'd like to play out play, and more specifically, bricolage in architecture in two ways. The first being the presence of the playful process, evidenced in its output through the conflation of multiple sources, a true polytemporal architecture. Firstly, City of Composite Presence, drawn by David Griffin and Hans Kohlhoff in 1978, a project made from the cut-and-paste assemblage of plans of great historic monuments. Beyond the visual provocation that the drawing presents, the resultant demonstrates the ability for spatial volume, proportion, regularity, and irregularity of each building to become more perceptible due to the different typologies confronting each other. Secondly, The Goodbye House, drawn by Stephen Lauf in 2004. Laos instructions read, collage the Gooding House and Buy House projects mainly because of the polar oppositeness in terms of architectural style and attitude both, form both formally and toward the idea of domestic architecture. Number two, enlarge the front wall of Absicon and then put it in place of Buy Wall. Number three, continue the collage by then also adding only the Absicon cornice all around the applique columns. He writes, it might make for a very interesting hybrid program or then again it may produce something ridiculous. Alex Maimon's Continuous Cruciform. Here, Maimon is inspired by a game invented by Colin Rowe and John Hayduck called the Continuous Plan. Maimon writes, the game played by Rowe and Hayduck leads us to believe that forms created by bricolage do not rely on interpretation, misuse, or indifferent usage of certain past architecture, but instead offer the possibility to critique and simultaneously create new combinations of form. Recollage to defamiliarize, hybridize, and invent. This sensibility is transferred into my studio, uh, where we borrow conceptual characteristics, round plan, free plan, or nesting, as well as literal elements. Uh, the previous image was uh, produced by a student of mine, uh, Evie Brooks, who will have to make sense of it in two weeks. Uh, this brings me to another way to think about the productive nature of recollage and process. Uh, I'm reminded of Colin Rowe's operative history where the collection of representation and facts becomes speculative, generative, fictional, and most importantly, projective. Upon receiving the 2015 Topaz Medallion, Peter Eisenman presented some thoughts organized under the title Authority and Originality. Eisenman discussed uh, his adoration and emulation of architects that came before him, at first Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, as a way of knowing when he would have arrived at original work. Uh, one example of this, arguably one of the 20th century uh, architecture's most salient storylines, uh, which will conclude with a recent project of mine, demonstrates this reliance on intellectual engagement and reenactment during the production of speculative architecture. Uh, here, uh, Wittkauer's schematized plans for 11 of Palladio's villas. Uh, the result is an abstracted set of villa plans which produce a hypothetical original and at the same time an additional, a 12th villa. Uh, here, architect, theoretician, and historian uh, are blurred. Around the same time, Colin Rowe, in search of a more transcendent discourse on order and proportion beyond humanist principles, argues for mathematical harmonics. Rowe's unorthodox and non-chronological view of history made it possible him, for him to develop theoretical speculations 
uh, as opposed to factual accounts. Fast forward to 1994 and Greg Lynn, where Witt, and Rowe use mathematics to cancel difference. Uh, Lynn searches for innovative formal and spatial strategies by embracing the unideal. Lynn's project of an inexact geometry born from the emergence of, di of the digital in architecture is calling for a more speculative process of differentiation and variation. Uh, Lynn identifies Rowe's blind spot, the capacity for formal and spatial order to differentiate and become innovative, and conceives of his own project in which the exact and the ideal are misaligned. In a similar fashion, a recent competition project of mine, the 13th Villa, conceptually builds off this idea of differentiated order. The 13th Villa is inspired by Greg, Lynn, Greg Lynn's intellectual provocation and attempts to generate a new villa, one comprised of the unideal characteristics and traits of each of the Palladian uh, villas that Wittkauer drew. Where Wittkauer and Rowe negate the difference and Lynn embraces the ser and serializes difference, this project attempts to embody difference in a constructed, singular, non-ideal. If we accept Michael Meredith's definition of architecture, that medium plus convention plus play equal architecture, we must value the idiosyncratic, non-systemic, and oftentimes illogical ways in which architecture is conceived of through playful processes. Parallel to this playfulness is the regimented, vetted, and at times tidy collection of artifacts from architecture's past. This tension between the idiosyncratic and the typical, and between the haphazard and the regimented, is embellished in the employment of bricolage as a technique for architectural production. Just as was the case in the faculty exhibition, techniques of bricolage involve elements of unpredictability, chance, unseen elements, and group collaboration, all in service of disrupting the mind's appetite for relentless order. Uh, bricolage offers a strategy for serious play. I need a glass of wine. <laughs> We actually should have cut you off there. No, my, I had two slides that were, that one slide was 40 seconds. <laughs> I abided by the I abided. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so I'd like to talk about two main themes. Uh, one is play as a process through which to stoke creativity and find more innovative and unplanned design solutions. And the second is the playful aesthetic. So there's this relationship between kind of play and seriousness that, that Kyle just spoke about and that is inherent to many, many of these things. And as designers, we need to sort of be able to transition between these, these uh, different modes of operation. Um, much like kids are not playing all of the time. They have sort of specific moments in which they're encouraged to play. Um, and uh, especially um, uh, mid-century um, toys made by the Eames and others that uh, really push this kind of creative um, attitude forward. Um, much like now the innovative companies like IBO are, are encouraging sort of unplanned um, play where uh, quantity is more important than quality in sort of proto early prototyping schemes so that you're not self-censoring your design work but you're actually pushing um, things as far as they can go. Um, there's also, uh, you know, projects that are prioritizing the kind of material behavior um, as a playful um, uh, way of generating form. So it's guided by a sense of, uh, or a set of rules, but not rules that the designer really has much control over. Um, and that relates to this kind of idea of iterative design development, but iteration in a way that is, again, not self-censored, doesn't have a kind of predetermined product, um, but is really about that process and doesn't, doesn't know what, uh, what end it will come to. Um, so the idea of doing things over and over to really understand those materials um, or those forms better. So this is a project that Greg and I did a couple years ago where we're looking at um, ideas of candy as it can uh, uh, be useful in architecture. And so we made these really dumb models of candy, not because we wanted our building to look anything like candy in the end, but because we wanted to understand certain qualities of candy that might make it um, really irresistible to children. This was a, a children's museum competition. And so finding ways that um, the texture, the color, the sort of uh, flavor blending uh, uh, as, a, as a kind of analog to programmatic blending could start to come into architecture. Um, we also see this really clearly in um, out, what's called sort of outsider architecture or naive, naive architecture where um, a number of the, the following um, uh, 
designers that I'll show are people who didn't have an end product in mind when they were um, building these, these amazing um, pieces of architecture, but rather it was about the process, it was about sort of the collection, the accretion of material um, over time, um, and just this sort of pursuit of a kind of fantasy landscape of sorts. Um, and so, and that's, that's the, the kind of idea of, of landscape as fantasy, um, as something that can be pushed and doesn't have a kind of final end product, um, is really, I think, uh, what segues the sort of play as process um, to stoking creativity into the idea of the playful aesthetic. So um, obviously a lot of these projects have a tremendous amount of color. Um, here, uh, Pip and Pop's landscapes, which are very, very tiny, um, use the vibrant color, but also kind of ideas of cuteness in the addition of other objects, um, and ideas of in, in the inversion of scale to produce this kind of miniature landscape of both fantasy and fiction that can kind of play out in different ways. And this is also stoked by um, recent competitions like the fairy tales competition which just ended its second year um, that's about pushing a kind of fantasy narrative that really prioritizes the experience of architecture um, in a in a way that that goes far beyond what um, what a lot of us do in sort of our, our renderings um, experiential renderings um, also playful aesthetic in the sort of inversion of material so ideas playing with ideas of sort of um, implied softness um, versus hardness, again, kind of a, a scalar uh, issue um, and uh, ideas of form, the, the sort of roundness. Um, here, obviously, referencing things that we associate with children and sort of fun events. Um, uh, playful attitude, again, towards materiality here, so uh, giving us a sense of softness where there is, in fact, no literal softness. Um, and uh, the color, the, the, the glossiness, um, the reflectivity that comes into uh, many of these projects. There's also a very specific interest, again here, in sort of uh, inverting scale, looking at something that might be read as, in this case, an architectural knickknack, so something that we have an association with at a particular scale that then plays out at a, at a much larger scale, an architectural scale. Um, here also there's the sort of playful experience where all of a sudden the sampling of a piece of architecture, um, uh, architectural typology from a particular area of the company become, country becomes um, in fact a, a pillow that one can sort of lay on and, and um, nestle into. Um, which I think starts to play out uh, in um, Greg's uh, piece in the, in the exhibition um, where the architectural model is sort of re-envisioned as a plush toy and how the, the ideas of softness um, sort of uh, invert certain ideas that we typically associate with the architectural model. Um, also the sort of building block condition of, of that model um, playing out again as a sort of inversion of scale, uh, making architecture that behaves more like a toy. And so these installations of, of MVRDB are somewhere in the middle where they're taking ideas that happen at a much larger scale. They're not making them totally toy-like, um, but somewhere in the middle much like what Paul Preisner is um, doing in, in this scheme, where instead of designing one large building, um, he's breaking it down into kind of smaller pieces that start to behave like these sort of toy building blocks as buildings, um, specifically playing with that scale um, and obviously ideas of color uh, to, to um, push that further. Um, the piece that I did for the exhibition is also looking at ideas of scale um, where the, the um, hatching in the background and the actual scale of the elevations um, at the uh, you know, lower point of the drawing is meant to treat the building as a kind of play product or as a toy more than um, the architectural scale that we typically, um, typically think of. So I just wanted to close with um, a, a quote by um, Stuart Brown, a contemporary American um, psychiatrist who talks, uh, does a lot of research on play, um, and he says, play energizes us and enlivens us. It eases, eases our burdens. It renews our natural sense of optimism and opens, up, uh, open us, opens us up to new possibilities. So um, on this idea of seriousness and play, I wanna say that it doesn't have to be either or, it can be and, and I think should be.
Okay. Go. <laughs> the caboose. Uh, so this, this talk is called Playing with Scale, or How to Make a Chimera. So what is a chimera, anyway? So according to Greek mythology, a monstrous, fire-breathing, hybrid creature, composed of the parts of more than one animal, usually depicted as a lion, with the head of a goat arising from its back and a tail, that might end with a snake's head. And this is a really wonderful Etruscan bronze. So the three inputs I received were, uh, my notations in red there, a plan from Larry Davis in which I detected four residential typologies, collage to create a train wreck, a view from Lawrence Chua, clearly differentiating a lower and upper world in a dogmatic square frame, and a section from Kyle Miller elaborating on deep cuts through the mass, and a pentimento scalar shift in the background. So scalar play or slippage has long been an interest of mine. Working on my Japan summer course, which will also focus on play between scales, I made a connection to traditional Japanese wood working joints as you could have seen in that last slide, a bird's mouth joint that got incorporated into my piece. In my first sketch for the project on the left, I played with three inputs. So Ch Chua's dogmatic square, uh, Miller's deep gouges, Davis's repetitions, and especially the strong striation between top and bottom, base and towers, to which I added my interest in the details of wood joinery. I was thinking about the variation in scalar play in urban settings like here. This is a photograph I took in Seville about a year ago where windows, porches, houses, towers, and other iconic shapes inflect towards one another. These same scalar connections and misreads began to inhabit my chimera in figure ground, in form, in mass versus object, in details playing at the scale of the city. And here again, you see some from Kyushu, Kyushu uh, Seiku, uh, which was a gooseneck tenon joint. This kind of play has existed for a long time in design culture. Imagining the house as a city, the city as a house, for instance, goes back at least as far as Alberti. Aldo Rossi's works played off of what he termed persistences in urban forms, and these could exist in his work at multiple scales. His buildings carry echoes from the past in the use of forms that have a universal haunting quality. And that was something that was said when he won the Pritzker. You can see the drawing that he did of the uh, coffee urn that, in that last slide. Michael Graves, a former mentor, continually painted evocative landscapes, which could be read at many scales as a collection of furnishings, houses, or small cities. The common ground was a play of simple forms engaged in complex and ever-varying conversations. <laughs> and long time ago, Deborah Nevin said that Graves worked with things like doors, windows, moldings, rustication, walls, and so on, that while performing their obvious structural functions also carried symbolic meaning with which our culture has imbued them. Perhaps the most chimera-like from this period are the drawings and paintings of John Hayden. In the CCA's collection notes online, a remarkable connection is made between this kind of play of his with persistent elements such as squares, cubes, cones, circles, cylinders, and so forth, and a deep desire to connect with place. In fact, they go on to say it is Hawthorne's House of the Seven Gables, a New England Gothic anthropomorphic portrait of a house pulsing with the uncanny memory of history and place that must have spoken most directly to Haydick. And in these sketches that you're seeing that are my uh, way blown up out of scale sketches from the Chimera process, and over there on the left, a kind of wacky window detail from Morocco that I took about a year ago, which reminded me of the mane of that lion. Uh, I also am playing with a similar kind of set of interests, figure ground, uh, formal, uh, and so forth. The construction drawings for my, what I claim to be solid stone chimera in the other room, 
um, here blown down, but you can see that they were pretty detailed in order to get that thing cut just right. And just a, a note, a few slides, that it doesn't end here. In furthering this scalar play, I have other parts of my work, not just chimera objects. And I use digital patterns to transform sheet materials, including wood, to create three-dimensional artifacts that range from lamps to chairs to doors to walls. In play, to the making of the new small house uh, for the 21st century. You see some details from some of these investigations in terms of making flat materials do things that they don't want to do. Some of the lamp studies, which also have printed patterns on them that can be reversed. These are 20 seconds. <laughs> 20 <laughs> second there. Yeah. And sometimes become doors. In this case, one attached to a room that was a small bathroom made minuscule by virtue of the performance of the door. And finally, I find it interesting that the terminology for many construction joints discussed earlier evoke other living things. So perhaps very chimera-like, words like bird's mouth, gooseneck, finger, butt joint, and so forth. Just food for thought. That's it. Am I on? Oh, I am. Excellent. OK, um, it, it falls to me to uh, perform some kind of response, um, which is a little, I, I, it's also the first time that I've heard these presentations, so I feel like Mark Rubio doing the um, response to State of the Union whenever it was, they sloughed it with a glass of water. Um, okay. I don't have pretty pictures, and I think it's my job to try and pull back some of what the panel has presented to us, all of which is um, fruitful. Um, and in often, often many cases, sort of very specific in terms of the kinds of projects that are being shown. And just try and um, tie it back, let's say, to three uh, relationships between, let's say, play and not play. So that's what I'm going to try and do. Um, so thanks for your contributions. I've just got five or six minutes to, as I say, tease out some of the more significant questions, I think, raised by your respective presentations. And then we'll open things up to a Q&A for a little bit longer, where I hope uh, everybody here will... will come up with a question. Um, my primary concern, if you can, my primary concern in getting to grips with sort of issues of play over the past few weeks has been, um, and in digesting the panel's presentations, has been an attempt to map out the various strands of discourse around play and playfulness that have, I think, inevitably been discussed in the context of architecture, as people have already alluded to for quite some time. Um, now, the resulting diagram, which the panel is familiar with, I admit, is a little convoluted. So I want to consider some, some key terms instead right now. Um, and as Jonathan mentioned in his uh, introduction, um, <clears throat> uh, mentioned this term homo ludens, which was uh, an epithet coined back in 1938 by Dutch historian and, and cultural theorist Johan Hutzinger. Uh, excuse my Dutch. Um, now, as the diagram suggests, I want to draw a distinction between Hutzinger's homo ludens and what other theorists have described as perhaps Homo Ludens' more recent incarnation. And I would venture to, to suggest that most of us in this room would fall into the, the category on the uh, right-hand side of the screen, um, which is Homo Ludicus. Um, so where, uh, let me just find my point. So as the diagram suggests, I want to draw that distinction. Now, um, Homo Ludicus is a character that the video game theorist Pepino Ortoleva um, uh, refers to and argues, I think, persuasively that where well, Homo Ludens, or um, we might say playful man of the 1930s, understood the division between labor and play, that is between Homo economicus and Homo Ludens, um, and that Homo Ludens would have understood that at least for adults, the world required a rigorous definition of playful behaviors and their confinement in a defined and stable space time. Today's Homo Ludicus seeks to capitalize on the fall of this rigid division between the space-time of labor and that of play. This delegitimization of the barrier between games that are acceptable for adults and those that are not 
leads, it's argued, to the formation of a vast area of semi-ludic behaviors, one that Hutzinger would fail to recognize back in the 1930s. Indeed, if we can just quote Hutzinger directly on architecture, since we put his term on the table, he says that um, the architect, sculptor, painter, draftsman, ceramicist, and decorative artist, in spite of his or her creative impulses, is in fact ruled by their discipline and always subjected to the skill and proficiency of the forming hand. Very different view back in the 1930s of, let's say, where architecture sat in, in the um, arguments about where play and seriousness might sort of overlap or intersect. Um, I agree with Otto Lieber, the more recent theorist, and others when they argue that we are witnesses to and probably also participate participants in a process that is leading to the progressive substitution of games with playfulness, of the ludens with the ludicrous, the deframing as opposed to the end framing of game, and its reframing with different and possibly very arbitrary borders. So the ubiquity of such playfulness I think poses a series of problems for discussions like this. We need to sort of distinguish its boundaries in order to, uh, let's say, create a discussion about its character. If it's everywhere, it's sort of nowhere. Um, and this throws up a series of questions around the emerging relationship between what we used to think of as perhaps, uh, I had to Google this one because I wasn't sure it existed, uh, uh, dichotomonic, which you know, we're all used to the word dichotomy, but there is actually dichotomonic uh, relations. Now, I don't have time to unpack all of this now, but I do want to just set up or propose three uh, dichotomies, or perhaps no longer dichotomies, in, in order to ask the panel to kind of respond to uh, those relationships in terms of what they've presented for themselves. The first of these is work and play. Um, and I'm going to offer you some, some tidbits <laughs> just to kind of introduce um, how we might begin to think about this. So if we think about uh, the relationship or the, the line that lies between ideas around work and play, I want to refer, refer to uh, theorist Mark uh, Jar Zombek's writing. Um, when he wrote back in 2009, in relation to um, the work of Philip Johnson, um, uh, that uh, he wrote a, an essay effectively called Johnson's Role in History. And in that essay, he argues that Johnson's playfulness and his indulgence in the excess of ease, right, the, the privileging of the simple or the, the deproblematization of work, let's say, um, accomplished something startlingly sort of original, which is something that we might think of as hard when thinking about Johnson. And in Jozombek's kind of estimation, um, Johnson succeeds in the name of architecture um, um, of excluding from architecture, let's say, almost everything that we would think of, it, of as important and constituted uh, of its sort of disciplinary character. Now, um, Jozombek uses the terminology drawn from Kant, being history and German words opus and arbeit, which we might substitute with, let's say, work or labor. But... Um, the provocation here, I suppose, is to, to find value uh, detached from an architectural practice that is interested in the production of stuff, and the nature of that production, and indeed the sort of value of work that attaches to that production. Um, many of the panelists have sort of referred to uh, aesthetics of ease or of simpleness, or uh, uh, the idea that these things sort of emerge, or that um, we can iterate these processes. And these all challenge ideas around uh, say, more linear processes of design. Um, incidentally, I would add, no, there's a lot of work that we haven't seen today from sort of contemporary designers. When I think of the parametric project, I'd be interested to find out where all of that stuff, which, you know, we saw some of in uh, lectures over the course of the semester, where that fits in. We've seen a very sort of narrow section of, of, of uh, contemporary practice. So my second um, sort of dichotomy, if I move on from work and play, is connected. Um, because I think much of what the panel have talked about and some of the terms they've put on the table also challenge us to, to think about the relationship in design um, and in architecture between um, failure and success, which is a, a little bit of a hobby horse of mine. So um, this second pairing um, uh, examines that line between the idea of a successful failure or a failure of success. And here I want to refer to um, uh, an essay written in 2006 by another theorist, Mar Marcus Verhagen which um, was really about the work of an incredibly successful failure. That is the German artist uh, shown in the image here, Martin Kippenberger. And in that essay, uh, Verhagen argues that Kippenberger's work um, 
those of you that don't know Kippenberg, he once acquired a Gerhard Richter painting and turned it into a coffee table and kind of reinserted it back into a gallery. And, um, uh, so Verhagen argues that Kippenberg's work was a little like that of uh, Alfred Jarry's Pierre Ubu, in that it was back, a representative of a vastly restive and energetic figure who tipped everything he touched into a bilge of crude sentiment and doubtful humor. Kippenberger, so the essay argues, never missed a chance to rubbish a lofty view and always preferred the infantile to the measured and the pointless to the productive. Um, which I think again feeds back into our ideas around work and play, as well as success and failure. And so the last category that I want to draw attention to, and which we might smoothly segue into, is um, a slightly stranger dichotomy. I wasn't sh sort of sure how to phrase this, but I ended up with sort of skepticism ver versus earnestness. We might add to that sort of the earnest pursuit of knowledge. Um, we have somebody here who's interested in design knowledge, or was, at some point. <laughs> um, uh, so, when we think about skepticism and earnestness, I want to, to refer to um, a book by Aaron Vinegar in 2008, which sought to um, take another look, or a fresh look, at the work of Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, um, and particularly their, their, their work leave, uh, leaving Las Vegas, learning from Las Vegas. Um, uh, in that book, um, Aaron Vinegar tries to construct a case whereby he relieves both uh, Venturi and Denise Scott Brown of the burden of some more of the, the burden uh, cast upon them, as it were, by more orthodox critics, criticism that tended to focus on their facile ironies of their work. This is a quote from a particularly grumpy Italian um, Tafuri. Um, and what uh, Vinegar attempts to do is restore their work um, via a reading of uh, philosopher Henry Cavell's understanding of the wondrous and the ambivalent power of skepticism to a position that privileges a condition of literally being thrown off balance, a state of disorientation and of not knowing. Um, and this, the author argues, precedes the fall into orientation and meaning. Um, and so this last category is really about the, the status of knowledge in a, in a, in a playful environment. Um, Kyle and others use sort of, um, lots of terms that we're relatively familiar with these days, defamiliarization, um, abstraction, all of these techniques or terms that maybe we use to describe a singular technique uh, to confuse us, to throw us off balance, to, let's say, bring us pleasure via the, the sense that we might discover something new in things that we perhaps thought we already understood. Um, so that's why I, I, I sort of leave you with skepticism and earnestness. And so really I want to ask the panel, uh, any one of them that sort of wants to chip in, and hopefully one of them will, uh, to maybe just reflect on, on some of the things that they've put on the table in terms of the, the types of projects that they've shown us, and ask, uh, let's see where the thresholds of those sort of relationships lie between work and play, let's say success or failure, and if anybody wants to take it on, skepticism and, and the pursuit of earnest knowledge. Um, I mean, I think it's an, it's an interesting set of binaries, and, and we could also add a fourth, which is the topic of our fall conference here. One of the things that I've been thinking more recently about, and hopefully a thought that uh, becomes productive as it pertains to my work, but it is not the kind of binary nature of these terms, but the fact that one could perhaps be a precondition for the other. So success or failure precedes success, play precedes work, uh, skepticism precedes earnestness. Um, and in preparation for the fall conference, I've been reading some of the essays that I referred to that I think uh, are related to, to this binary. Uh, Hayes talks about culture and form. One of the things that was particularly interesting in the essay that um, Robert Sommel and Sarah Whiting write in response to that or as a follow-up to that is this notion of the precondition that uh, in their case they write about autonomy as a precondition for engagement. I think it's more interesting perhaps to think about like, criticality as a precondition for instrumentality. So I think at some point Skepticism is necessary in order to clear space for earnestness. Uh, if we look at the example I presented, I think Greg Lynn is kind of skeptical about the reduction of, of this geometry to something that is ideal and, and, uh, and then thereby pervasive into all cultures.
But I think in a way that his skepticism then paired with the, the relevance of new digital technology at that time led to a kind of earnest pursuit of something that could be considered new, original, novel. Um, so I don't know how, what, what others would have to say about the binaries, but I found it more productive to think about a, uh, a kind of sequence of, of terms rather than an <coughs> oppositional nature, which I think then you have to choose a side and uh, is maybe not as um, robust as allowing one to follow the other or that for them to engage in a particular relationship. So I guess my response to your response is that uh, I've started to think about these binaries as actually uh, at, at one moment uh, coexistent and one feeds the other. Um, um, <laughs> well, just some, going back to the first pairing that you made of work and play, and just some kind of thoughts about that. One, one thing that popped into my head right away was Hannah Arendt's writing on homo, what she called homo faber, you know, the, the person who makes. And, and I think just establishing for a moment that background on work, on the word work, uh, <clears throat> you know, the idea, maybe the halcyon idea, the utopic idea that somehow um, uh, as a reaction to a capitalist uh, disaggregation of parts, that one could imagine the craft the, the, the value of work somehow coming back into, into, I want to say coming back into play, but I don't want to use that word. <laughs> um, I just throw that out there because then fast forward to uh, Constant and the Situationists um, reacting to a post-war situation where it, it appeared in a kind of utopic moment that work would no longer be necessary, at least not for the vast majority. And in looking at the New Babylon prop proposition, you know, play becomes, and of course, um, the homo luden is, is the character, right, in New Babylon, um, is, is the person for whom New Babylon is designed and imagined. Um, and it's a person who um, basically uh, has, is, is free from the kind of fetters that we might normally associate with work under the capitalist domain. Um, on the other hand, in a close read of that, I've always been interested in the fact that, like in Disney World, where we find that there's, a, there's an underground, and the, whatever they're called, the Mouseketeers or the Imagineers, or what, whoever it is that occupies that underground, to keep things nice and tidy, um, probably has to exist in the New Babylon. Um, and so it's, it's just kind of, you know, fraught situation. Um, Wait a minute, there was a third thing I was going to say. And, oh, and then, and then maybe at the same time, the fascination with the study of play by people like the Smithsons. Uh, I can't remember the famous photographer who was sent out to, or who, whose photographs they were so enamored with, who was photograph photographing children, again, post-World War II. Does anyone remember the, I can't remember the guy's name, but um, beautiful black and white photographs that get disseminated a lot in that period of children, quote unquote, at play, in the playground, but of course discovering that they're really at work, as Molly was talking about, they're, that, that work somehow is play. Um, so I, I guess I'm just trying to unpack those two words right now, and there's a kind of deep history with them, which I would separate in my mind a little bit from another way in which we were talking about play, which is also part, I think I would separate this, part of, uh, and, a, and a fundamental part of the way that uh, we practice and explore ideas in the field. But somehow to me, I think there, yes, there's an overlap there, but I think there are different discourses. I'd like to follow up on that point. Um, I've been really uh, interested in what uh, Tim Brown, the CEO of IDEO, has to say on the topic. He talks about play a lot because they, um, at IDEO, really focus on uh, sort of non-self-censored uh, moments of exploration um, in the early design process, in the sort of prototyping process. And so when they're coming up with the early, um, early sort of solutions, possible solutions for um, the various different design challenges that IDEO faces, it's really about going for quantity 
and not at all about quality. And um, understanding that that's a really critical kind of period of that design process, but that at some point it shifts and that in the, um, in the sort of uh, moment where the kind of testing of that prototyping happens and the development of that design, then there's a shift from play to something maybe more serious. And so um, uh, I think it's really interesting, this relationship between play and seriousness, because they're, they're to me, very related on a spectrum. Uh, but there's moments where um, sort of play is more critical and moments where sort of a serious pursuit of something is more critical. And so the way that you can kind of, the, I think the relationship that, that your work can have to both of those sides and the way you negotiate between them becomes the, the sort of um, question of, of what they call productive play. So how, how productively, how, how sort of um, can you not uh, censor yourself, can you not judge yourself in those early phases such that you um, uh, come upon designs that are unplanned, that are totally unexpected from what you sort of had set out for yourself, um, but then develop them in ways that, um, that becomes a sort of productive play exercise. I'd just say a couple of things. I go back to, to Benjamin and, and kind of very early thought about unfolding of work in play, so in a way the two are, are, are fundamentally linked. Um, I, I think it's interesting relative to uh, in moments when play becomes the object of mass production in things like the consumption of sports and, and mediated spectacles. So I can increasingly wonder where is the where is the space of play. Um, and related to what Molly's saying, the fact that a company like Google hires people to play. Um, and, and so there's a, it seems to me they're hiring people to play. Um, not sure what the end result is, but presumably the end result is towards some kind of capital accum accumulation. I want to make a distinction, or I'd like uh, others to make or comment on distinctions between a game and play, and I guess then the idea of rules. So Poisinga really presumes that with play there's rules. Others will say that um, really the, the game is, is object-like um, and requires rules where play is individual and subject-like, another kind of binary which I think we've um, in some instances tried to break down. But I guess that would be one question I might have. To what degree is, is play um, bounded by rules? Like if you're jumping rope, you're just jumping rope. You get to 20 and you decide, I'm going for 100. Then all of a sudden it has a, a, a certain kind of structure. Um, and in that sense, um, again, going back to, to, to Boysenka's um, premise, do we need, to what degree do we need rules in order to play? So um, I think that's a sort of fascinating question. If I just take it back slightly to you said, what's the difference between gaming and, and playing, which you know we often use sort of interchangeably, perhaps. Um, and some of what sort of uh, inhabits this discussion around Homo ludicus versus, versus Homo ludicus is the idea that one's about a game and the other is about unbounded playfulness. Um, the game being something which is is whereby the, the rules are known beforehand, which is something you picked up on. Um, and it's, it's bounded, both sort of spatially, you know, in the case of a board game, sort of literally, uh, but also sort of bound temporally, so that we can we can finish a game. It resolves somehow. I think the argument about Homo ludicus, which are most of which uh, seems to emerge from video game theory, which is becoming more sort of uh, there's more and more of it. I won't I won't I won't sort of pass judgment just to say there's a lot of it these days, and it's sort of bleeding beyond the narrow confines of what we used to call video games. Um, whereby we're sort of um, interacting with the world almost entirely through apps these days, whether it's uh, finding a partner or ordering a cab or finding out what we're having for dinner. There's a strange kind of uh, ubiquity and pervasiveness of, sort of playful interfaces, both in terms of those kind of, uh, you know, the phones that we have in our pockets, but also in the, the types of uh, sort of digital landscapes that we negotiate actually within video games, which produces this idea of ludodramic landscapes. And I think that idea of boundedness is, or, or lack thereof is really interesting because 
as, as Molly just sort of described, I, th I think what you were describing there was something that knows its limits, something which um, uh, one employs or deploys as a strategy to, let's say, get you off the starting blocks as a design process so that you don't fall back on the same old cliches or you don't produce what you like last week. You know, that, that thing that we're always trying to get our students to do, which is sort of to, let's say, distance themselves productively from the task at hand such that they might uh, begin to evolve things in a little bit more unexpected way. And yet there was a moment that you described, a sort of transition whereby, and this is one I'm particularly interested in, whereby a whole set of, let's say, more orthodox concerns start to, to, to assert themselves and start to come come back into view issues of quality or, or resolution. We might also say authenticity and what that, that means in a sort of ludo drumming environment. Um, and so that, that twist for me, that turn, that I think is probably practiced by all of us at one point and another seems to be one of the most problematic moments in contemporary design practices. What are we making that turn for? Um, and what does it produce that playfulness wouldn't if it were uninterrupted by that? It, it seems like a uh, rhetorical question, perhaps, but, but I, I, I want to I engage it anyway because um, I guess, it, or, or maybe it's a chicken and egg, you know, because I think that um, you could then go back to something you were saying a moment ago, which I won't try to quote um, or remind you of, but that there's a um, why, why play if there's not. A, a, a sense that there's something that you're going for, even if you don't intend for it to be a known, it, it can't be known, right? If it were known, then you don't need play. As you were just saying, you know, then you're stuck in a rut and you're repeating the same thing over and over again. But at the same time, if there's, I, I think your question's an interesting one, why stop the play? Or where do you stop the play? And I, I, I think, I think Molly was right, there's this kind of sense that somehow in that cycle, there's a moment when you transition, wherever that is, and it may be in different, in different locations. But I, I, what I'm trying to say is why you might ask, would you ever get into play if there weren't some kind of however loose, some kind of objective thing, something, e even if we don't know its name? It feels like this might be a discussion which really turns on an idea of what, what's the core of architecture, what you saw of the, the irreducible core of the discipline, which seems to be where all of these discussions sort of end, end up one way or the other, for better or worse. It happened with Atwood. Yeah. Could, 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 could the audience ask? Yes. Questions? Yeah. yeah. I, I, actually, uh, I, I consider myself part of the audience, so I think <laughs> you, you could go first. May I go? Sure. Yeah. I, 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 this is, um, I think it's, it's incredibly interesting and fascinating. The, the, let's say the, um, the footnotes that attach to almost all of, many of these presentations come from a, come from a period. Uh, Ted cited uh, the work of Jean-Francois Lyotard from, that's the, the postmodern condition is from 1979. Um, and, you know, for, for me, what's fascinating right now, and I saw this a couple of years ago when I went to SciArc's thesis reviews, and I saw Benjamin's review. Uh, it was part of this. Um, there was a school for, that for many, many years um, had, a, had an incredibly uniform kind of approach to design and to the discipline and to architecture just as a larger, let's say, condition and cultural condition in the world. And then all of a sudden, a couple of years ago, there seemed to be a, a breakdown in that. And every and everybody seemed to be looking for something again that was redolent of a kind of authenticity. And, uh, and, and what I find really fascinating and kind of, um, I want to believe in it, but I don't. Uh, but I want to believe in it. Uh, is that almost all of the all of these presentations, and I think the I think the um, the, the exhibit as well, um, all are trying to leverage something in leveraging play that's similar to that interest that many of those students and faculty and the institution at Sire was interested in in going back to something more authentic. 
Um, so I think we're, we, we live in a very weird time right now where <coughs> this interest in a kind of a 1979 smashing pumpkins kind of uh, interest in leveraging some authenticity, um, it's hard to know if it's mannerist or is it real. It can't be real. It, it cannot be real. So what is it? It's interesting. I don't know what it is. Because there's a, there's, a re, there's a real, real difference. Molly invoked Tim Brown, the work of IDO. There's a dramatic difference between um, the kind of prototyping that Google does and that IDEO talks about, and people like Michael Schrave talk about, and even the gaming culture, Ben, ben that you talk about, which um, is interested in processes that result in more and more and greater and greater degrees of innovation, but with no interest whatsoever in accessing authenticity. So let's say there's a huge difference between the new, which, is a, which has an interest in accessing some kind of authenticity, and innovation which has no interest in that whatsoever, in, in my view. So I'm, I, I, I love this stuff, I, 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 but I don't know, I'm much more cynical um, and um, have lived this before, so I don't really know where to place it, but I, I love it. I love hearing some of the names of these people again. I forgot. I didn't think anybody remembered any of this stuff. Um, but but it's, uh, let's just say for, for students uh, who hear all of this as little bits of footnote, it all makes sense, believe me. It's all part of a moment in time. The question I have is now, um, what, you know, what is this moment in time, and what's the relationship between this leveraging, this 1979 prying open of some kind of access to authenticity, and... Could you, could you unpack authenticity a bit? Uh, the, the belief that something actually has some purchase on something real or authentic or crafty or... Let me, let me give you an example. Um, you may know, th there's a magazine called Monocle. Uh, Monocle magazine is among the most beautiful and cynical things I in the world today. Because everything they do gives the appearance of craft, of design, of um, specialization, of, um, of considered kind of curatorial interest, but it's actually incredibly flat. Yeah? So, uh, for example, Monocle is, is, is obsessed with paper, and that is because their whole enterprise is based on retaining print publications and in proliferating an interest in those because they make a lot of money doing that. Hmm. I don't have a problem with that, that's great. But, but it's not authentic, right? It's a, it's, it's a kind of Baudrillardian third order leveraging of authenticity for another purpose. I don't know what the purpose is. So it, this, is just, this is just a kind of a, a very old school, but um, I think, I don't, not cynical, but um, li already lived through this moment kind of wondering of where all of this leveraging of craft, authenticity, the real, where, where does it sit today? Where do we go with this? I don't disagree with it. I just don't know where, what we do with it. Anyway, I, 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 I love it. I find it incredible, and I'm so thrilled we're doing it, but um, I don't know what to do with it. Does that make I, any sense at all? I don't think I can. I can attempt. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. defer my question to later. <laughs> yeah, that's probably good. I can attempt to follow it. I mean, I think, yes, many of the discussions that we've had, I think, conclude with um, a lack of. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I th absolutely. Not like entirely. I think it's I think it's fair. I mean, but I think but I think we're moving out of it in the sense that it seems to me that there's less of an emphasis on defining the legibility of, of a core or what constitutes authentic architecture. Because that has I think quick, quickly or maybe very recently become just de deemed navel gazing where, where it's in it's insular, it's self serving and, and maybe there's no end to that. It's just turning in on itself again and again and again. But I think there is value in um, Attempting to access, uh, well, I, I use the I use 
Michael Meredith's definition of, of medium plus convention plus play. So I think in, in that sense, play, and this maybe goes back to Ted's question, can rely on knowledge and technique that has been already vetted as architectural knowledge, things that come from the study of buildings, techniques that have been developed for production of architecture. And then I think the real interesting thing that I probably can't speak so precisely on now is the impact of contemporary culture on the ways in which those things shift and then dictate how play alters it th over time. So whereas I think, and this is only an observation that I've made like within the last couple of weeks, there's less of an interest at this very moment to define that core or what constitutes authentic, authentic architecture, but, but uh, 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 maybe a responsibility to feel like something is inherently architectural before it so it demonstrates its critical value before it demonstrates its instrumentality. Just a, a quick follow-up, and I, I want to hear Benjamin's uh, disagreement as well. Um, uh, is it possible to appeal to the discipline without appealing to authenticity? And if, and if not, then what are you appealing to and appealing to? Yeah. Maybe just a quick, quick response to that. Maybe, maybe Molly. I, I, think, I think that's the crux of the yeah, I, I think maybe Molly's more equipped to answer this, but, but the way that Jason Payne always talks about disciplinary territory is that he's always reaching outside, grabbing things from outside the discipline that are not, do not reek of authenticity, pulls them back inside only to re-territorize architecture and expand its, its disciplinary plot. So I think in that, in that way, and I think Molly and Greg's work does that quite nicely, that it's not so concerned with starting with something that's capital A architecture, but in not doing so, actually, as it moves into architecture, but gains disciplinary out, value. To reach outside the discipline, you have to know what the line is that separates the discipline and the non-disciplinary. Yeah. And so that's and so there is so this is this is a rule set. This is a game. Right. So to to go outside the discipline, you have to believe in a game uh, whose rules you break, in a sense, to reinforce the primacy of the game itself. What you're saying, however, is that is that gaming culture, in the way that you refer to it, is, is, it exceeds that boundary yeah. to, 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 to such an extent that the discipline itself is so ubiquitous that it, that it disappears. Essentially, and the, this is where the, sort of the, the terminology gets confused, because we, we actually turns out that gaming culture don't gain, they're playful, if we like, follow the sort of arguments that we've been making. I would just say, I don't think it's a return, I think it's a looping back, which is, which is Something, I don't know, it's something about not being able to step into the same river twice. I think that that, that difference is important because it's, it's not that we're, we, we, this isn't an intergenerational discussion where you know, we advocate on yes, behalf of our peer group. I, I mean, I think there are architects right now who are, are, are selling a fairly, um, the fag end of a, a pretty disastrous version of authenticity. Most of them um, uh, live and grow up in Switzerland. And there are a few Brits that do it too, and there are even Americans. Um, uh, Steve Hall, for example. Um, I, I don't think that's that's where Sion was, and I, I, I don't think that any anybody sitting around here. No, is. no, 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 nor do I. So questions of authenticity are yeah, they're being discussed partly yeah. because I feel like well, personally, I feel like the generation who preceded us uh, uh, is often very keen to sort of exclude terms, and, yeah. and, and we sometimes feel slightly robbed of them very lexicon that we might otherwise begin to exploit. I, I mean, we sort of run it. This is the, this is the Syrac excuse for being on the West Coast and you didn't have enough to fury. I think that's not, <laughs> that's not a good enough excuse. I, I, look, I, 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 this looping back, I, I agree, I don't disagree with, but, that, but, but the looping back exists entirely within the, the kind of possibilities that are laid out in postmodernism itself, so so I, I don't have a problem. With it. I, I find it I'm, I think it's very interesting. Even the great Rimpool House, after all, this year had uh, a terrible, in my view, and ridiculous and historicist uh, uh, Venice Biennale exhibition that was premised on uh, a return to some kind of authenticity, which he calls elements, and uh, you know, so so. So, but do you, it's, 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 you know, so, so a lot of us are doing this. It's just so. I mean, what is the? What are we doing when we do it? I, is, I, there I, another, is there another choice? That's my question. Well, I, I certainly very consciously, of course, included all those tidbits in, in my slides from a particular period, but certainly not because 
that's where we need to go back to, that's what we have to recuperate, that's what was authentic, or anything like that. But I think that there, you know, I do think that there are those who believe that there was some kind of fundamental rupture, um, <clears throat> which precludes then ever looking again at certain kinds of tendencies or trajectories. I tend to think that questions get asked again and that the questions are what the, the threat is. In, in a way, for me, the, the analogy might be when they talk about a correction in the market. You know, it's not so much a look back or a let's go back or we're searching for authenticity, but that there, there was definitely a long period of play in the digital and it required that in, intense sort of moment of radically new technology that some of us remember, but probably not many in the room, required a, a, a unbelievable concentration of effort and shift in teaching, in the way the profession worked and so forth. And I think that, I, I tend to think of it as a, even correction is too strong a word, but as, as a kind of moment of regrouping to sift a bit. But I think what emerges are questions, that's what I was trying to get at, that um, get asked again and again, but answered differently. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it undercuts the idea of authenticity. But, but not the authenticity of the lived condition, but the authenticity of how you answer. Sorry, mm -hmm. I, yeah, it sounds like phenomenology. And people are getting very <laughs> uncomfortable. I don't mean that, but I just mean that people will move, people will encounter whatever villages, homes, uh, what, and they're going to be, and families, or whatever that might become, and those questions about that condition, I think there, there's an echo there. It's not exactly the same, but I think there's an echo. So I tend, I don't know, is there a better word than what they use in, in the market, you know, that it's recalibrating? But something along those lines. Because authenticity, I mean, you're very, being very provocative because I, I think that no one, no one here is going to claim that, oh yeah, you know, I know where it is and it's upstairs on the third shelf of the library or something yeah, right, like that, right? right? And yet this... But, 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 but it, is, it would be fair to say that almost every reference, almost every person cited from Yatar to Eisenman to Venturi to uh, their, their operational use is that they broke open and through a kind of critique what appeared to be a kind of a homogeneous, mm -hmm. let's say, consumer culture to find something more real, more authentic, more whatever. That happened at a certain moment in time, and it seems to me that we've moved past that moment. What I'm asking is, if it's not historicist and it's not mannerist, what is the what is the use of leveraging those kinds of references today? That's a, that's a, that's a, I think that's a legitimate question. I, I do believe, I, and, and we, we talked about this in, in some of Jean-Francois's uh, seminars, and this was the purpose of having somebody like Graham Harmon here. Um, I do think there is a legitimate and real interest in returning to something called the real or let's say in, in, in accommodating the real in a way that has not been accommodated before, and particularly in architecture. If you look, at, if you look, from, the, look from, the, from Jenks's early work with George Baird, screwing around with, with semiotic models, we have the discipline and even the practice has been dominated by an inability to see outside of linguistics into the real of architecture for fear of being called phenomenological for about 40 years. And so, <laughs> and so. Don't you think Graham Harmon is a phenomenologist? I don't agree with, um, I don't I agree with almost nothing that Graham Harmon <laughs> says. <laughs> but I'm very so interested yes. in speculative <laughs> realism, and even more so in somebody like Mia Su, who is interested in the real, but not in a phenomenological I don't even think Harmon is as well. I guess what's interesting is what they put on the table in philosophy, is an interest in accommodating and accessing something that we used to in phenomenology call the real, but we're afraid to call it that anymore because of, of, of the, let's say, the sweep of the linguistic paradigm that's dominated. So anything that you, any argument that you make, you hear a smart ass like me saying, 
that's authentic. You can't say that outside of language, right? What is compelling about Harmon and Speculative Realism is that they are saying we can and should try to access that. Yeah? Um, and, and this has happened in philosophy. This has not happened in architecture. It's not because most of the people interested in Harmon are interested in kind of third-rate retoolings of Harmon to create a design protocol, which is as stupid as the, as the way in which architects use Gilles Deleuze and uh, slime mold. It, it's stupid but inevitable, or stupid and not inevitable? Sadly, inevitable because architects are stupid, yes. <laughs> Architecture. Every, everyone in the room Indeed. takes issue with that. <laughs> I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if a way of moving beyond this might be. No, this um, is <laughs> um, I, I, Even coming back to, to, to no, we're we're still on it, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but uh, coming back to one of Ted's provocations about the the difference between um, play and, and game, and and I would probably go as far. Know, go for, further into sports or sports as with Greg and Molly's um, namesake uh, because it not only has rules that, that delimit it but there's a whole um, cultural structure surrounding it there's there's um, you know it, it means a lot to you know all these these people in these tiny English towns where they, they their their team gets really deep into the FA Cup, it means something for them for, for generations after that. Um, there is a, a cultural identity that's, that's involved in, in the limitation of sports. There's in, in enormous um, economics that, that are attached with it, with um, uh, uh, whether you play within the rules or outside of the rules, the whole um, steroid controversy. So uh, if, if that becomes more of a uh, more of uh, an, anal an analogy for, for architecture and how we work within architecture, then we start to get um, a little bit closer to this uh, groundedness that, that, that some of this playfulness means. Like all of these sports started in games, started in play, um, that then had now um, limits and structure and rules and and people saw the value in it and saw how to commodify it, how to sell it, how to make it much more pervasive than it, than it actually is. Um, and, and I can't help but wonder whether that's more of a model for, for, for what we do and how we think about what we do. And then um, uh, the, uh, the irony in that is that the most successful athletes and, and sports teams are the ones who can find fun within it, can find playfulness within the confines of the sport that they're paid millions of dollars to do, to, 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 which is really their work, it's their job to, to perform this. But the ones who think of it as a job can't get to that point of ultimate freedom, of ultimate um, uh, uh, enjoyment of what they do. Um, maybe that's some way of changing the conversation. I guess for me, the. That's something that's already recognized by, by Cavois, which would be a kind of crisis that, that what was a game becomes essentially uh, market driven. Um, and so I asked the question, you know, where is the space at play? And I think that, um, again, Benjamin's work on second technology is really useful. I, I'm interested um, in, in one generation's interest in, in Reusinger who's um, in the same room with, with uh, Benjamin and Calvin, um, and the, the interrelationships between those, uh, those figures I think is remarkable. And the, the kind of prescient nature of some of the thoughts that come out of there, which I think are <coughs> remarkably, remarkably pertinent now relative to issues of, of technology, the, the collapse of subject-object space, um, are remarkably, remarkably pertinent now. And, so, and, and I, think, um, I think we loop. I think it's good to loop. It's great to loop. For me, it's great to loop, you know? Um, but I guess I, I don't see it as, um, I see that as a, you know, I'm a skeptic, and, um, because I see that as, as Reinhold Martin talks about in empty form, two things. One, Reinhold Martin talks about in, in empty form, his aspirations for empty form, which can never be empty enough. Um, that you know, his opinion 
any thought that we have, any theoretical thought we have, um, capitalism has already thought 20 years prior. Um, and so he, he, his desperate interest in a kind of absolute, and in the impossibility of an, ab an absolute emptiness. And you could say the same for certain uh, ideas of gaming. The other, quite specifically, is I coached T-ball for a while. I don't know if anyone knows what T-ball is. T-ball is a remarkably stupid game based on the game, great game of baseball. Um, <coughs> for four-year-olds, like 16 aside. They all play T-ball, <laughs> um, So you know what I'm talking about. You know, 16 aside, the sense of, of organized sports, you know, is, is just ridiculous um, at the, for lots of reasons. Um, you know, one is, is you've got people uh, eating grass in the outfield, um, but the other is, is that that presumably is their time and space of play, which you which you've taken from. I wanted to uh, go back to something that Michael asked before. No one is answering any of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know if I'm going to answer it or not. I don't but... think you can. <laughs> um, but you, you're asking about the, the core of the discipline and. I guess, or, or you're asking about kind of what, what constitutes the, the, the kind of the shape of the discipline in, in, in some way? No, I'm the center. I'm, the center. I'm just, I'm just, I'm asking, is it possible to even invoke the discipline without invoking at the same time some idea of authenticity? In my view, it's not possible. Is it, is it reasonable to say that the... Discipline. We have a question. Wait, wait. I have a question. Wonderful. This might break open the debate. <laughs> um, uh, sorry. So on the question on um, whether it's a, um, able to appeal to architecture without bringing up the question of like authenticity, but this question has architecture has been on this pendulum that has been swinging back and forth um, between like finding the other and then going back to the authenticity the authenticity -ness. and I don't think it's possible to evoke some to to go to this end of the pendulum without swinging back because ultimately I feel like we have to be we have to stay relevant to the masses and the masses wouldn't understand the otherness here that's why I feel like we quit uh, swinging back finding the authenticity -ness, the fundamentals just because we'll hit them, will appeal to them again, stay relevant, and then we'll swing off again, and then... And I, then... I, I totally agree with you, but that, that, that's, that's, a, that's an exquisitely cynical view of authenticity, which I yeah. share, uh, which, is, <laughs> which, is, which is that you create something that appears authentic to those who don't know any better. I mean, we're good so salesmen. So that you can manipulate it, yes. That's, all, that, that's, that's the only use that authenticity has today. I mean, I have to say, I find Sekou's invocation of Premier League football as a way to talk about authenticity, one of the most bizarre uh, invocations in the world. I mean, because um, uh, Premier League football actually does not belong to those places anymore. There is no one uh, who plays on any Premier League football team that is from the club in the town that it's from. And the, the, but, 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 but this is a question you have to answer. But, but in fact, the quality of the football is the highest it's ever been in the history of the game, but it's the most inauthentic. Yeah. So don't, it, don't we have to, we either have to abandon the use of the term, which yeah, may be what I'd you're... Like to use it. Yeah, you like to miss, well you like to... Exactly. You, you sort of fetishize the inauthentic. Exactly. Exactly. We either abandon the use of the word or we, we pluralize it and talk about multiple authenticities. That seems to be a, a classic way of getting out of these, these arguments. I mean, in a world where um, I can be friends with somebody by ticking a blue box on screen, questions of that type of authenticity seem to me, it seems to be, to, to, we could point to billions of examples of, by the definition that you guys give in relation to the premiership, you know, inauthentic structures. That would seem to me to be a call for us to find some alternative yeah. ways of... Just to be clear, I don't believe in authenticity or inauthenticity. They're the same thing. They're the same thing. I just why we call it inauthentic, the, the, the quality of football right now. 
Like this, now, I thought I understood your definition of authentic before, yeah. and now. But what you're, you're really making a claim that we should move on and talk about something else. <laughs> um, I'm interested in, I mean, we need to wrap up fairly soon. I'd be interested to hear more from students. I think that would be fantastic. Um, are there any other questions? Quite a few. You can talk about the premiership as much as you like. Yes. Okay. I, um, I have two questions. The first one is for Professor Hunker specifically. So I know that your firm is Sports Collaborative, and we've been talking about sports a lot. I'm wondering if it's um, the name of the firm is related to um, principles of play, and if any of them are related to any of them up there. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> that's, that's my answer. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, yes. Uh, our our sense of, of sports. Um, so the, the, the name comes from a just sort of number of, of things, but the kind of general basis for it is uh, the idea of rigorous play. So kind of playful agenda that is also guided by a framework of rules. Um, so that's the kind of easiest thing. Um, but also, I think, I think to, to some degree, sort of tapping into what Michael's talking about, I think for us and for, for um, maybe some other uh, young people who are sort of finding their voice in this time. Um, I think it has to do somewhat with not, not necessarily authenticity. I'm not totally, I'm not aware of all of the baggage that I know that word has, so I don't want to talk specifically to that, but um, to an idea of sort of uh, familiarity and um, kind of relationship between users and, and our architecture, the experience that we have and the engagement that we have with that. So understanding things that are familiar, things that um, are comfortable, um, and ways that we can sort of tap into those ideas, whether they're specific to architecture or outside of architecture. And so the kind of, uh, to me, uh, Kyle brought up Jason Payne earlier. I think Jason is someone who has a very clear boundary to the discipline. And I think Greg and I in our work and, and other people um, who are uh, looking at similar ideas are interested in actually blurring that boundary entirely or not even really having a boundary to begin with. That architecture is um, uh, full of designed objects and so are many other quote unquote disciplines that they're all designed objects and as such can be um, uh, can be learned from and can be leveraged in our further pursuits of other designed objects um, so so yeah so the idea of kind of uh, those ideas starting to develop a kind of framework within which to play is very much a part of a part of our process and a part of our name okay thank you um, and the second question um, I'll try to make it quick so that just one? No, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> All right. I was just curious to see um, how your approaches to play have affected um, how you try to encourage students in your studios to experiment with play. Um, I know that my studio professor right there, Professor Corso, he's like, yeah, have fun in architecture. Like, don't, it's not all painful. And we're like, whoa, that's a thing. <laughs> and <laughs> So one question is like how values, um, how your values like and views towards play like um, influence your students and um, I know that Professor Louis, my um, professor for rep, he encouraged us to like um, do stuff in Rhino and like all cool tacky things. So I see that as like another tool for play. So I'm sorry for pointing out people. <laughs> I'm just curious to see how that like um, is present. So if, if I understand, um, one, one of the things that I can speak to in terms of this, this idea of play, um, could, could be the way that you start to, and, and Molly, you brought up uh, um, the, the kind of blurry boundary of the discipline for your, your architectural project. And, and uh, you, one of the things that I start to think about is the, the rules that um, start to define um, our discipline that we operate within internally. Uh, and if I were to understand your statement correctly, that would also mean that um, 
you are interested in, in understanding the rules of other disciplines and seeing if there are kind of overlaps or intersections or ways that you can start to possibly distort those, those rules to apply to the way that you start to operate within this discipline right here. Um, and, and I think that's something that, that we, we share, we both share, and I, and I think that's something that a lot of, a lot of people from our, our generation share. And I, and I think um, that has to do with, um, in some way, the way that we start to engage um, a broader culture um, and communicate to a broader culture. But I also think that um, it could be a way to start to um, merge, or not merge, but start to start to think about the relationship between idies and isms or, or ideologies and facts that, that we constantly are, are trying to battle against or battle with in, in different academic institutions. So, so to kind of get to your question, that kind of, that I guess for me it's about kind of setting up different ideologies and, and playing within the rules of those, those ideologies when, when we work in our, on our assignments or in, when uh, we work on a project, or I work on a personal project. I think it's a really interesting question. Um, uh, and I would, I would say that it's, it's important for students and faculty alike to remember the sort of strangeness of places like this, where you guys pitch up for, for five years, have an extremely sort of structured environment um, uh, you guys can all map your path to graduation in one way or another, right? I, I mean, as you get more and more tired and older and older, you start, uh, uh, that map to graduation becomes ever more important. Um, and, and so for, for me, as a relatively, somebody who's relatively new to teaching, one of the, the key problems, if you like, of teaching this, this subject at this point in an institution like this is the way in which the institutional biases, the things that we have necessarily to demand of you, um, to send you out the door being able to do, um, those are all sort of uh, things that quickly take on you know, some of this antiquated baggage around about authenticity. I find myself standing there over as a student, I don't think any of my studios here, so I can say this, you know, <laughs> determined to have them, you got a couple of them behind <laughs> determined to sort of improve their alignment, right, on a drawing, or whatever it is. And, and I find myself standing and saying, why, why am I doing this? It's tapping into a very sort of, uh, it's tapping into a pedagogy about what's good and what's bad in those kinds of products that makes me very nervous, and yet I still feel that I, we need to, it's our duty to take you through that. So to my mind, I would say that we probably too, do too much gaming in an institution like this and not enough sort of borderless play. Um, I went, as Michael's alluded to, I went to a California school for, for, for grad school and that, there were still a few teachers, professors there that were from a different generation to the one that Michael described earlier on. The previous generation was a school that grew up on the beach in Santa Monica. And boy did they know about unbounded play, those guys. And so there is a history of um, institutions, or let's say anti-institutions, delivering architectural educations of a kind, I think in a very different way um, to even the way that say, the younger generation here are offering it. In many ways, we, we perhaps we are somewhat uh, revisionist or... Uh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, could I just tack on to your, your, your question and just observe? I, 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 you know, I don't think it's necessary to appeal to authenticity. I, I just guess all I was saying is, um, a lot of the references, a lot of the ways in which you constructed your talks referred to a, a point in time when it was very important to break open um, what appeared to be a monolith and to find something authentic. That's clearly not what you're doing. I think the challenge of your generation is to determine a, um, in my, a, a kind of a coherent understanding what the discipline is without appeal to what Jonathan called ideologies, because he doesn't mean ideologies when he says that. What he means are design approaches. Ideologies are the kind of things um, that precisely this, you know, all these footnotes appeal to. I, I, think, I don't think we live in a world like that. I think we live in a world where it is looping. I think you really are not going back to something. I don't think you believe you're going back to something authentic. Um, but you have to be careful when you have old people like me around who, when you, 
when I hear these references, they sound like the same discussion that was had 20 or 30 years ago. I know that's not your intention. I know that's not. But I think that's the challenge. I think that's the challenge of work right now. Don't give up on the disciplinary discussion, but it cannot be, it, can't, it, it cannot be an ideological understanding of the discipline. It has to, it's, it is closer, I think, to what you're talking about. And, you know, let's say this appeal to something even outside of culture. Or you, can, you know, tend to. I, mean, I don't even think. Jason, I think Jason, for example, still has a very clear old school disciplinary understanding. I think you guys have that, but you, but you need as a generation to figure out what it is. I don't. I don't know what it is, but I think. I think that's the. I think that's the work of that. The last four or five years at places like Sire that seem to be trying to figure this out. A lot of people are trying to figure out. I think, I think it has to be. I, I, I think we're all very lucky that we have the ability to have a conversation like this, and we have a lot of the, we have a lot of terrific people here who are going to define what that uh, disciplinary discipline. Who are going to, who are? I think we have people here right now at the school who are going to participate in the construction of that new idea of the discipline. There's no question. I think we're very lucky, and we're, we're very excited to have. Yeah. New participants here, I along know, with yeah. older participants like me. Uh, um, who, who how, but, um, I think that's a challenge. I think that's a challenge for generation to figure, figure that out. Michael, we're going to give you the last word. I just had it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because we're actually wrapping things up. There's, there's some boots left. Um, <laughs> so, left. Oh, just. Let the games commence. Thank you. <laughs>